I'm sorry, I think I'm gonna wind up reading some of these bits verbatim just because it's so bonkers. Hello humans, my name is Dale Kingsmill. I have a fairy tale for you today. Good old Hans Christian A, I almost said H. Henderson. Hans Christian Henderson. This is the story of the elf mound. And I just, um, well look, Let's just get into it. So the story begins with these three lizards and they're, they're scuttling around and they're talking to each other and, and gossiping. The first lizard says, "Ugh, the fairies have been up to something. All night they've been stamping around and dancing. I couldn't sleep a wink. I may as well have had a toothache because I've had a toothache once and it also stopped me from sleeping. The second lizard says, "Ugh, oh, I know, they've, they had the, their hill propped up on posts, these, these red posts at the corners of the hill to, to hold it up so that it could be aired out, they could get a nice breeze through. And the third lizard said, yeah, I was just talking about it with the earthworm, because the earthworm has all the good juicy gossip, because um, it can get right up there in the mud of the hill and, and listen in, really good at eavesdropping. And the earthworm says that the elves are the fairies, just, just so you know, those are interchangeable in this particular context. The earthworm says that the elves are expecting visitors, distinguished visitors, but the earthworm doesn't know who, even though he's been hanging around and eavesdropping for several days. So is, is he uncommonly good at eavesdropping? Mm, question mark. But all of the will-o'-wisps have been sent out to, to light up the nearby countryside, and all the, the gold and silver crockery and cutlery has been uh, polished with moonlight, so clearly they're planning a feast and are expecting some very important guests. So just then, as all the lizards have been here gossiping, the elf mound opens and out comes this fairy woman. She has a hollow back, which if you're into fairy stuff, you know me, well, I mean, it basically just means that she's a fairy, but she's a fairy with a hollow back and that's fun. And she's all well dressed and she's got this amber necklace on in the shape of a heart. I like to think it's an anatomically correct heart because that's just really cool and frankly much more fairy. Apparently she had good legs, that's good to know. And she is apparently the housekeeper for the king of the elves who is her cousin. And so she comes out of the elf mound and she scurries off down to the marsh so that she can talk to the night raven. And this very weird little sort of high school moment happens where she says you're invited to our super fancy party but only because we need you to send the invitations to these other really important people. But if you do that for us, then you can tag along too. And she explains to the Night Raven that the fairies are going to have some very high-ranking goblins visiting their elf mound tonight. And so the king of the fairies wants to make a really good impression by having just the best guests that he possibly can. And the elfin housekeeper says, well, anyone is allowed to come to the huge ball that we're throwing. Like literally anyone, even mortals. Like as long as they can like talk in their sleep or any of those sorts of things that we can do, they can come. The more the freaking merrier. You get what I'm saying? This will be the bash of the century. But for the actual banquet, it's gonna be like really exclusive. So we're only inviting a couple of really specific people. Like not even any ghosts. Ghosts aren't even allowed to come. That's how exclusive. So basically we want the old man of the sea and his daughters. But we, I mean, we're on land and they're not gonna like that. So we can give them like a wet rock to sit on or something. I mean, maybe we can come up with something better. Just tell them we'll get them something wet to sit in. Um, then all of the trolls of first degree, but they have to wear tails, okay? White tie only. You got it? For clarity, I don't know whether this statement of with tails means that the trolls have tails or they're wearing tails. I chose by the mental image I liked best. Um, we have to ask the old man of the stream. Um, the brownies will be very upset if we don't invite them. This is controversial, but we've also decided that we're going to invite the grave pig, the bone horse, and the church dwarf, even though technically they all like live under churches. And so they're kind of really, they belong under the, the clergy umbrella. And those just aren't our kind of people at all. All. But still, they're like our cousins and they come and visit all the time and you know, that's just their job. We're not gonna judge them for their occupation so they can come too. Crah! Says the crow and 
flies off to deliver those invitations. On their mound, the elf maidens had already begun to dance, and they danced with long scarves made of mist and moonlight. To those who care for scarf dancing, it was most attractive. You know, if you're like into ribbon dancing, I guess it was kind of cool. So everything inside the elf mound had been done up super specky for the party. The floors had all been washed with moonshine, like, like the light of the moon, not I'm assuming not illegally brewed alcohol. And then they were waxed with witch wax. Wax on. Wax off. And the witch wax, and the w witch wax, the witch, the witch wax managed to make everything gleam like, like flower petals with dewdrops on them. The kitchen abounded with skewered frogs, snake skins stuffed with small children's fingers, fungus salad made of mushroom seed, wet mouse noses, and hemlock. There was much beer of the Swamp Witches brewing. Oh, maybe it was moonshine. A sparkling salpeter champagne from graveyard vaults. Ew. And among the delicacies were rusty nails and ground glass from church windows. So I mean, hey, there's apparently more than one reason that you shouldn't eat food offered to you by fairies. The king had his crown polished with powdered slate pencil, but not just any powdered slate pencil. The powdered slate pencil from a prized pupil. And that's not easy to come by, all right? So that's, it's extra fancy, okay? And the housekeeper looked around and she said, ah, perfect. Now all we have to do is burn some incense made of horse hair and pig's bristle. Then it will be perfect. And then it is revealed by the king that the guest for the evening is actually the venerable goblin chief of Norway. He lives in the old Dovrefjeld mountains. I'm basically Norwegian. And he owns a gold mine and a castle in a craggy cliff top. And the venerable goblin chief has two sons, eligible bachelors, and they're all on their way here, and the king is looking to marry off two of his daughters to these two goblin sons. Because the old goblin chief is a real Norwegian. He's honest and true and straightforward and merry, and he can say, Dovrefjeld. Am I getting close enough? And because, you see, the king of the fairies was old, like, college buddies, basically, with the venerable goblin chief. They used to go out binge drinking together. They're just like, they're like besties. And so the fairy king is like, wouldn't it be great if our kids got married? The goblins show up now, right now. Hand me my crown, let me stand where the moon shines most brightly. Do I have, I think I have a crown somewhere. I definitely have an inflatable crown somewhere, but I can't find it and TBH. Probably not worth it. And the venerable goblin chief comes in and he's all decked out with hanging icicles, fur cones, and a big old bearskin coat. And he's wearing sledge boots. Basically, he's pretty stylin'. His sons, on the other hand, didn't even have suspenders on and their throats were uncovered, the scoundrels. What of the goblin sons? arrives and looks at the elf mound and he says, is that a hill? In Norway, we would call that a hole. And his dad like hits him on the back of the head and says, no, a holes go in, this is up, this is a hill, it's a hill. And they go inside and everyone's gathered, all these important people, the old man of the sea and his daughters are there, they're sitting in like barrels of, of water. So I mean, that's, that's good. I'm glad they didn't get um, stuck with some wet rocks. And everyone has very polite table manners here, except for the two goblin sons. They've got their boots on the table, they're throwing food around. Get your, get your feet off the table! And the sons did, but then they, um, they took their boots off and handed them to the ladies to hold, uh, while they pulled fur cones out their pockets and used them to tickle. Tickle the ladies. The venerable goblin chief, at least, composes himself with some decorum and he talks a bunch about Norway. He talked well of the proud crags of Norway and of waterfalls rushing down in clouds of spray with a roar like thunder and the sound of an organ. He told how the salmon leap up through the waterfall when they hear the Nixies twang away on golden harps. He described bracing winter nights on which the sleigh bells chime and boys with flaming torches skim over polished ice so clear that one can see the startled fish swish away underfoot. Then he smooches the housekeeper. That, sir, is called assault. Then the fairy king's daughters do their dances, and they start with some pretty ordinary dances, then some well-known fairy ones, 
but then they work their way up to something new. They perform what they call the dance to end all dances. It was super complicated and anyone watching lost track of like whose limb was whose, like is this your arm or is it my leg? At some point they twirled around so fast that the bone horse from the churchyard, his, his head spun around and he had to go away from the table because he was too dizzy. Whoa, said the goblin chief. The girls are lively enough, but what can they do besides dancing like mad, spinning like tops, and making the bone horse dizzy? And so the king starts calling his daughters forward one at a time, each to show off their special talents. First he calls forward his youngest daughter, and when she takes a w I, I have to read this because I can't be responsible for these words. When she took a white wand in her mouth, it vanished away. That was what she could do, but the goblin chief said that this was an art he wouldn't like his wife to possess, and he didn't think his sons would either. So, the second daughter to come up, uh, she could do this thing where she basically made herself have a shadow. Because fairies don't have shadows, but she could do an illusion trick to, to make it look like she had a shadow. The third daughter could cook, Basically, she'd studied brewing with the local swamp witch, and she was a dab hand at seasoning older stumps with glowworms, we're told. And the venerable goblin chief says, Ah, perfect, that's what a wife should do, she should cook. Because, of course he does. Now this one would make a good housewife, said the goblin chief, winking to her. The fourth daughter can play the harp really well, she has this golden harp, but um, she, when she plucks a certain string, everyone's left leg shoots up in the air. I can't kick my leg high enough, just trust that I kicked my leg. Everyone's left leg shoots up in the air. And then as she continued playing, basically everyone became her puppets, and they had to do whatever she said. The goblin chief didn't like her because he's a coward. By this point, by the way, no one seems to have noticed that the goblin's sons uh, have gotten bored and they've wandered outside. Ugh, who? What a dangerous woman, says the goblin chieftain. All right, what can the next daughter do? My special talent is that I've learned to put up with Norwegians. Mmm. I like her. My apologies to Norway. The goblin chieftain did not like her so much. All right, he said, time for the seventh and the last. The elf king had to remind him that six comes before seven, but the sixth daughter won't come forward. She's like, oh, actually, my special talent is that I only ever tell the truth. And, uh, and no one, no one likes that. Especially this, this douchebag's not gonna, I mean. So the seventh daughter is the next one to come up after all. Her special talent is that she can tell stories and she would never run out of them. Fine then, says the goblin chieftain. Here are my five fingers. Tell me a story for each. We don't get to hear the stories that she told, but apparently she, she got through three of them until she, wait, it's probably this end, until she reached the fourth finger, which had a golden ring on it, like a wedding ring. And the chieftain said, hold it right there. We're married now. You and me, we're married. Forget my sons, I'll take you to marry myself. And the seventh daughter was like, but I didn't finish telling my five stories. What about the fourth and the fifth finger? Well, actually, she doesn't call them the fourth and the fifth finger. She calls them Goldbrand and Peter Playfellow. Apparently, your fingers have names. Ah, we shall save those until winter, said the old goblin chief. Then you shall tell me about the fir tree and the birch, of the ghost presence and of the creaking frost. I want a ghost present. You will be our teller of tales, for none of us has the knack for it. We shall sit in my great stone castle where the pine logs blaze, and we shall drink our mead out of golden horns. I have two that a water goblin washed into my hand. And while we sit side by side, Sagabo will come to call, and he'll sing you the Mountain Maiden song. Good. Well, I mean, if Sagabo's gonna be there. Then, finally, the chieftain notices that his sons are gone. You know where they were? They, they were out running through the fields, blowing out <laughs> the will-o'-the-wisps. And the chieftain went and he said, Come meet your new stepmom. And they said, No. <laughs> but they both gave speeches and then fell asleep on, on the dining tables. And so the, the venerable goblin chieftain and the seventh daughter, who was now his bride, they dance all night, and uh, instead of exchanging rings, they exchange their shoes. 
So, so it's like they're, they're dancing in each other's shoes. Because apparently that's a more fashionable fey wedding custom. And then they could hear the, the cock crowing outside. It was about to be dawn. And the housekeeper fairy says, Oh no, we have to, we have to shut down the elf mound so that the sun can't come in and burn us. And so they, they put the, the hill back down. And the three lizards who are still outside are like, Oh, well that was nice, wasn't it? We like that venerable goblin chief. And the earthworm who's there says, I preferred his sons. But as the last line of the story reminds us, he had no eyes in his head. So that's the story of the elf mound. It's a little bizarre, but I also kind of just love all the little details of like fairy things that get described in it. Like the idea of having like shards of church stained glass windows as like a delicacy at the banquet. Ah, oh, perfect. Oh, love it. Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed that story. If you did, this is YouTube, you know how it works. You can click any of the things that you would like to click. Been a little while since I did a fairy tale. I, I enjoyed that. Apart from that, I do believe that's it. I'm done. Email this to your grandma and I'll see you some other time. Somehow it just feels like I should have had the gentleman involved in this one, so I thought I'd bring him in.